It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Mark L. Cannon, DDS, MS, who received his doctorate of dental surgery from the University of Nebraska and then attended Northwestern University for his master's of pediatric dentistry. He completed his residency at Children's Memorial Hospital and received his diplomat status by the American Board of Pediatric Dentists. He is a past president of the Illinois Society of Dentistry for Children, a professor of Oterolaryology Division of Dentistry at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, an attending physician at Ann and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital, and a member of the International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. In addition to being the founder of Associated Dental Specialist of Long Grove in 1981, he is the research coordinator of Pediatric Dental Residency Program at Ann and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Cannon has 40 years of experience in pediatric dentistry and has presented lectures at the University of Athens, Greece, San Paulo State University, UNESP, um, Arequituba, Brazil, University of Texas, Houston, University of Alabama. The list goes on and on and on forever. Dr. Cannon has lectured extensively on many oral health topics, including evolutionary oral medicine, the gateway microbiomes, biologic and bioactive dental materials, and he's a patent owner, probiotics, and all aspects of everyday pediatric oral health. Dr. Cannon has humbly accepted two invitations by the Karolinski Institute, first to the Nobel Forum 2016, and secondly to the Nobel Assembly in 2017. Most of all, Dr. Cannon is a proud father of five, all of whom are very accomplished. He is also a very proud grandfather. Well, happy day after Father's Day. How are you doing today? Well, I am fine. Thank you so very much. That was a great introduction. Well, you're, I mean, you're an amazing guy. There's so many things I want to talk to you about um, being a legend in pediatric dentistry, but you're so fascinating in the um, the new thing, which is the evolution or, or expansion of the understanding of the gut microbiome and how this is affecting oral medicine. Um, when, when did you get interested in the gut microbiome? I mean, we didn't hear about this in dental school. Well, actually, I got interested in the microbiome uh, in the 1970s. I worked as a microbiology lab assistant working with all the periodontal pathogens and trying to understand how they influenced our autoimmune system, how they influenced our ability to defend ourselves. This becomes so important later on. It's, this is the most fascinating journey. Here I am. 1974-75, I present a paper, I think it was late 75, and it was the role of Bacteroides meningogenicus 25261, the role of the phagocytosis of that by macrophages and the influence on our immune system. And we were postulating all these things about pro-inflammatory cytokines. So you fast forward I've become very involved in probiotics. Uh, you know, I've published a couple papers on probiotics. We did the big probiotic studies showing that in reality, if you want to control dental disease, probiotics are a wonderful way to go because the commensals defend the host. This all merged into evolution because you can't know where you're going without knowing where you have been in the past. And there are so many, uh, Howard, you know this, every other day, there's this amazing publication that comes out showing how the microbiome affects our behavior, how you know it affects us epigenetically, how it turns on cancer genes, all these amazing articles. Um, like for instance, breast cancer, that the, the, the breast has a specific microbiome, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Let's go back to dentistry. So I, I'm in dental school, and I'm doing all this research, and I get recruited into pediatric dentistry. And I get over to Northwestern, where I start working a lot with biological materials, got to work with some of the best people in, in dentistry, Evan Green or uh, Bill and Sally Marshall, very famous people, Jack Farrakane. So I kind of merged into that, and I continued to teach and do research. And then I started to go back to my roots. And that was probably about 15 years ago. And I started to lecture more and more on the microbiome. So let's, let's go back to what we're talking about, the gateway microbiome. 
You see, as we've evolved, we have evolved protective microbiomes, and we have these gateway microbiomes. Uh, the oral microbiome is a gateway microbiome. The nasal cavity has a gateway microbiome, and the placental microbiome. And amazingly enough, these microbiomes, this group of bacteria, which is 97% commensals, these are the guys that protect you from dying. They protect your health. And that's why we survived as a species. So as time has gone on, starting about like 7 million years ago, there was a divergence of the hominids, which we're part of. And we had to break off the hominins about, what, 3 million years ago. And our gut bacteria and our oral bacteria all diversified, but specific. Every species has a specific microbiome. And our bacteria in the mouth, our bacteria in the gut, all produce extremely valuable things. And uh, I don't want to digress real quick, but for, for pediatric dentistry, one of our biggest things is, is early childhood caries. Well, kids who get early childhood caries, they're missing their nitrate-reducing bacteria, the bacteria that break down your green stuff, that turn it into nitrites. And when you swallow the nitrites, it becomes nitric oxide in your stomach. You probably have heard about this. You reabsorb it back. It's a very strong vasodilator. It's a very strong cardioprotective. In fact, there's great articles published in cardiology journals, like this is all published, I can show you tons of references on this, that nitric oxide is essential for health, for your heart health. Well, we have an epidemic of people low in nitric oxide. This is why there's epidemic in erectile dysfunction. And this is directly related to the oral cavity and, and oral bacteria because you're missing your nitrate-reducing ones. And that's why we again have a blub, uh, upward burst of decay and young kids. All this is interrelated. You know, I, I mentioned before we got on how I'm a member of the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. Well, everything's connected. So this gateway microbiome in the mouth protects you with all these positive bacteria, strep, uh, oral S strep uberus kills strep mutans, so you don't get decay. Strep salivarius kills strep pyogenes, so you don't get strep throat. So all of dental disease is a dysbiosis. It's not enough of the good commensal bacteria and too many of the pathogens. And everything we've been doing, which is shocking to me, is we've been killing the good guys. Most of the mouth rinses on the market that are antiseptic, they kill the good guys. They actually make you sicker. Now, here's just a shocker, but there's a good seven published articles on this. If you use a chlorhexidine mouth rinse, your blood pressure goes up significantly within one day. If you do what? If you use a chlorhexidine mouth rinse, your blood pressure goes up significantly in one day. Wow. Because you kill the bacteria that are producing the nitrites from the nitrates, and you don't have a good enough level of nitric oxide, which leads to erectile dysfunction, periodontal disease, more decay, cardiac issues, and of course, issues with airway. Now, we've got to get back to understanding the value of the gateway microbiomes. And the fascinating to me is that there's a placental microbiome. Now, Dr. Kirsty Argard published a number of work on this in translational uh, journals and uh, translational research journals. And there's a very specific microbiome to the placenta. You know, babies are not born sterile. They're born with about 10,000 different strains of bacteria that we now know because of taking cord blood and looking at the bacteria floating around in the cord blood. And of course, now they've got these great studies on cesarean babies. And there was some brilliant research on like in 2004 uh, where they actually, and th th this is really fascinating. I'll, I'll get to the point real quick. They uh, gave a bacteria from the human breast to mice 
a commensal bacteria from the human breast to mice, fed it to mice in, in their food. And these were pregnant mice. And they went in and they checked the amniotic fluid on those pregnant mice. And the bacteria was in there floating, alive. Because there's maternal imprinting. The mom will pick up bacteria from her gut, from other sources, transmit it through the bloodstream. This is published in Pediatrics in 2007. And they, they're they kept alive in the monocytes of the cells, and they're delivered to the baby via the placenta. The placenta builds it up. They come from the placenta into the amniotic fluid. The baby swallows the amniotic fluid. They get their gut primed. They get their immune system primed by all the commensals. What destroys the system are the pathogens. If the mom has periodontal disease, and if they have porphyromonas gingivalis, by levels, or as you well know, the famous research that's been done by many people like Yip Bing Han uh, with the uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum, that bacteria breaks down your tight junctions, you get a flood of pathogens that go from the mom's periodontal issue into the blood and it ends up in a placenta. And so that gets to the baby. And that's one of the leading reasons they found for miscarriages. So again, oral health even determines if the baby is born. Kirsty Argard did that great clinical study in Malawi where they had these pregnant moms, big study, chew xylitol gum. And from what I understand, just like the studies that were done in Japan and elsewhere, much better birth rates on the baby. They did a study like that in the UK too. Lower rate of miscarriage. So we as dentists, Howard, we're standing on something that's amazing. We're the guardians of the oral gateway microbiome. We're also the guardians of the airway because we're the ones controlling the width of the maxilla. We're the ones in charge of whether a person actually will have obstructive, you know, uh, sleep apnea. And that's because, you know, a lot of times it's consoles ad noise, especially when kids are involved. But otherwise, we're really the ones who set the stage. So, well, we'll talk about that more later, but let's go ahead now first with the microbiome. So if we've got to, in our practices, understand that our main mission is preventing dysbiosis. Our main mission is to prevent disease. A great study came out of Japan and uh, looking at Japanese children. And there's four main types of porphyromonas gingivalis. There's type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, based on the fimbria. It's called type, you know, uh, porphyromonas gingivalis, fim A, type 2 is the main pathogen. Howard, what keeps you from getting porphyromonas gingivalis, fim A, type 2? Having porphyromonas gingivalis, fim A, type 1 or type 4? Because it's just like Fusobacterium nucleatum. If you have the protective strains, they colonize it, and you don't have the bad guys. So you don't get the periodontal disease, and you don't get something else. And this is something I think is the most important thing in dentistry today. There's a disease out there, Howard, and I call it NAGS, Neural Arterial Gingival Simplex. Let's think about this. This is something where all the listeners have to start going like, wait, we got, let me pull off the road here and think about this. We have a disease organism, Porphyromonas gingivalis, specifically FIM8 type 2, that has been directly linked to gingival disease, periodontal disease, atherosclerosis. The work done in UCLA and elsewhere when they went into the atheromas and they found porphyromonas gingivalis, heavily the initiator of the arteritis that causes atherosclerosis. I'm sure you've seen those studies they've done, like the pig study where they gave pigs high cholesterol and they had another group, they had normal diet, and then they also did bacteremias with the porphyromonas gingivalis. And those that had the PG got the atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a result of a bacterial invasion of your coronary arteries and your aorta. So that's part two. We have the gingival 
and we have the neural. Because as you know, the last couple months, all the articles come out showing that the main organism, cause of organism with inflammatory Alzheimer's is porphyromonas gingivalis. So you see, Howard, we don't have periodontal disease. It doesn't exist. It's all a symptom of one disease called neural arterial gingival simplex. We have three symptoms from one causative organism. And you can trace this all the way back. Like Lancet, about five years ago, had that publication on mummies. And they looked at mummies from 4,300 years ago, and they did CTs, and they found atherosclerosis. Okay, they go, oh. And their conclusion, there's about 20 authors on this, was, oh, there must be, quote, a basic predisposition to this disease. Howard, if you look at the CTs, they obviously didn't have a dentist on that author list. They all had periodontal disease. When the first Norm Bridges was done about 4,500 years ago on a mummy, because if you look at all those mummies, they're like missing their lower incisors. They've had remodeling of bone because the teeth have had to been removed because of severe periodontal disease. Porphyromonas gingivalis became a pathogen from being a commensal in the Mesolithic period. And it exploded about 10 to 12,000 years ago during the Neolithic and the late Epipaleolithic period. So there was a big explosion in periodontal disease. And long before strep mutans exploded, which started in the Neolithic period about 10,000 years ago because of change in diet. We started eating a lot more carbs 10,000 years ago. Our diet changed, and that's in the cavity rate skyrocketed and continues to skyrocket, taking off hugely in the Industrial Revolution in the 1840s because then sugar became very commonplace. Often it was actually subsidized. Taxes were reduced on it. You know, After all, we had the sugar wars in the 1700s between France and England and all that. And then we had this next revolution, which I call a fast food revolution, which is because so many issues. But all these carbs are feeding all these pathogens, and these pathogens are creating this huge systemic health issue. And in dentistry, we're looking at the dead canary because we're like the coal miners carrying around a canary in a cage, and all of a sudden the canary drops dead. And we go like, oh, let's, let's put a fake canary in. So we put a wooden canary in. That's our, that's our dentures. Those are our crowns. That's our fillings because we got to make that canary look like it's alive. But how are those? Those are all dead. I mean, that's the beginning of the end for the individual, the host, because it's like if you came down with rotavirus, you wouldn't say, oh, I have headache disease, chill disease, fever disease, diarrhea disease. You would say, I have a rotavirus infection. So using the same logic with all our patients with periodontal disease, they don't have just periodontal disease. They have NAGS, neural arterial gingival simplex. And the sooner we can convince our profession and insurance and governmental agencies that we're looking at a national health crisis that is 100% preventable, you can block porphyromonas gingivalis. You can block fusobacterium nucleatum. They're both very sensitive to polyols. They're very sensitive to erythritol and to xylitol. And so there's many other pathogens, too. For instance, uh, you, you had mentioned Nobel. And the, the invite by the Nobel Committee on Medicine and, and Physiology came because of research we had done at polyols at Northwestern University and Children's Hospital. And supposedly, uh, I've been told this, and I can't find anything to the contrary. I was the first dentist ever invited by the Nobel Committee on Medicine and Physiology. And it was because of work we had done on polyols showing that erythritol and xylitol, which are used in many dental products, um, are capable of blocking the microorganisms that are involved with autism and autistic spectrum disorder. And there's a lot of gut microbiome stuff with autism, which you know I do a lot of research in. And the, uh, we got a great study going on right now with the microbiome, the oral microbiome and autism. So we have all this going on. And one of the things we tested 
was not just the clostridia involved with autism, but the clostridia that involved with C. diff, C. diff, uh, uh, clostridia difficile. And we had two strains of C. diff. They were the two biggest killers in Chicagoland. And they were extremely sensitive to xylitol. So you could have a 10% xylitol drink, and you have to remember your toothpaste is 20% some old xylitol, and your mouth rinses, your the xylitol mouth rinses you use are over 20% xylitol. They're extremely sensitive to it. I went lecturing. I lectured some up in Canada, some other places. They got really excited. So many parts of the world now, not so much the United States. Isn't that always the case, though, Howard? Yeah. I, you're nodding your head. Yes, I can see that right now. That's always the case. So here's the scenario. We, uh, it was a, a suggestion by, by one of the guys in special infectious disease at, at Children's Hospital that we put in these two very strong controls, two strains of C. diff that antibiotics have been ineffective against and are the two biggest killers in Chicagoland. And C. diff kills a lot of people. Okay. And um, they were both, both strains were very, very susceptible to the polyols at a low concentration, easily done in any type of drink. You know, you can add that much erythritol to a Monster Zero, for instance. And it just hammered the C. diff. Well, that got me an invite to the Nobel Forum. And the next year, I got an invite to the Nobel Assembly, so I got to be part of the assembly for that year. And it's just a year; it's not. A, it, it's I don't want to over overstate it at all, overblow it. But it was interesting being the first dentist to be part of the Nobel Assembly and all that. And but the thing that was interesting is in discussion with people at the Nobel. I said to a few of them, "I feel awkward. I feel like I'm." I'm I'm beyond my capability being here having lunch with Nobel Prize winners, going to have a beer with a couple of Nobel Prize winners in medicine. And I said, because I'm only a dentist. And they all looked at me and said, no. I mean, because he says, the, the type of research you've done and your contributions are enough that if you, and in fact, they used my research as an example of how you could come up with something that is so simple and inexpensive and can save so many lives. You know, almost as many people die from C. diff in the United States as, as will die on the highways. It's almost the same number. So it's an amazingly simple thing to do and so safe. So I'm really kind of excited to be part of that. Um, so we've been using that very same principle now looking at the effects of xylitol and erythritol. We know very small amounts of it will actually have effect in the biofilm in the mouth. So far, we've seen no negative effects whatsoever from it, just reduces decay. And of course, we're hoping we can use it to fight nags, that neuroarterial gingival simplex, which is one of the biggest things we have to do. We have to convince everyone that when you see your dentist, they're working hard to prevent heart disease. They're working hard to prevent diabetes. They're working hard to prevent inflammatory Alzheimer's. And those visits are extremely important. So anyway, Howard, that's, that's the beginning of the evolutionary oral medicine phase. We have seen these changes go on in mankind. We have all these environmental influences on our microbiome, really sets up the placental microbiome, which sets up the fetal microbiome, which sets up the development of the human. And during every stage, every fetal, the developmental stage, from embryo on up, from like 24 days on up of development, bacteria influence the development of that baby. And it's very important. So uh, I strongly encourage that people would really work hard especially with women of childbearing age, to make sure that they have the appropriate oral microbiome and that you use a good amount of polyols to prevent these issues that we run into uh, with the pathogens. You know, there was now, a, in, in MD Magazine, uh, there was an article, Dentists to Blame for Increasing Spread of C. diff. 
um, because of use of uh, overuse of antibiotics. And they got a lot of quotes in there with a lot of really smart people. Um, do you think dentists are still over prescribing antibiotics and wreaking havoc on the gut microbiome? Well, there are some people. Um, I, I am very upset about that. We have had patients who've been referred in because they have uh, cavities, little kids, and they come in with a script that was written for amoxicillin, and there is absolutely no value in doing that whatsoever. Unless you see a big roaring infection, there's no reason to use uh, antibiotic. And Again, we, we mentioned autism and the research on autism. Um, the big studies they've done, the Danish hospital registry studies, they've shown there's an increased risk of autism in uh, kids whose moms have been prescribed antibiotics even up to five years prior to the pregnancy. It takes about five years for you to regrow your Oxalobacter formigenes bacteria uh, Oxalobacter formigenes is the only bacterial species that breaks down oxalate for you. Uh, humans don't break down oxalate just like humans don't break down gluten. Gluten's digested by your oral bacteria. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, Harvard did a lot of research in 2014 where they found 150 strains of bacteria that break down gluten into non-immunogenic uh, 16, 17, and 33 mer peptides. And it's really funny that people think because that's those developed after we started eating grain. We got those babies after about twelve thousand years ago. The Natufians started to harvest grain, and and hey, Howard, how's this for a fun fact? Why did the Natufians? Because they have good evidence for this. Why did that those people twelve thousand five hundred years ago? Now in the area of Syria, there where they have a big dam and lake, uh, Lake Saeed's there. Uh, why did they start to stay in an area for rye and barley? There was two main reasons. One was climate change. Climate changed significantly back that time. Uh, Syria was a forested area. It turned into a desert. And meanwhile, Europe that was covered with glaciers, the glaciers all melted, full of Neanderthals. You know, Neanderthals actually were dis disappeared before that. But the Neanderthals loved living up north because they could – their airways did a good job. They're well suited for living north. Um, the, uh, the, the climate change, they had to go into oasis, which means they had to go from little tiny little tribes into building themselves into actually little cities of like 5,000. But it was to make beer. So beer created civilization about 12,500 years ago. I'm going to back up to – Something you said earlier about the nitrous oxide producing bacteria and how it's um, that affects cardiovascular disease. I think it's very interesting that when um, I was taking snoring classes, that when you're coaching professional athletes, you always got to get them to quit mouth breathing and breathe through the nose. Because right. when you breathe through the nose, yes. you form nitrous oxide. And ever since I learned that, when you're watching like the NBA finals or the most elite athletes have their mouth closed at all time. And then I noticed that people that are um, marathon runners around here in, in Phoenix, some of them to train will put um, the electrical tape, the big old yes. duct tape over their mouth. Until they just get there, and they said that they totally, after a minute, they can fill it. I want to ask you one before we get sidetracked. Oh, here, going back to that real quick. Yeah. The other trick on that is people put, they take a, a sip of water, and they put the water in their mouth, and they don't swallow it. And they run with that water in their mouth until they get, like, down past the top of a hill. Then they swallow it. And that way, they're forced to nasal breathe, and that keeps your mouth nice and moist inside. Um, that's another trick that's used by marathon runners. And uh, yeah, you're right. Nitric oxide is uh, production. You get more of it by breathing through your nose. They've done great studies on that where they put tubes in your nose, and they check how much nitric oxide is produced, and they check against mouth breathing. Um, the other thing, going back to those top athletes, every type of athlete has a very specific microbiome. For instance, long-distance runners will have a different gut microbiome that contains 22 completely different phyla from a sedentary individual. Hey, Howard, guess what those bacteria do in the gut? They're in the lower, uh, in large intestine, lower part of the, the gastrointestinal tract. They break down what we would call indigestible 
carbohydrates. So when you eat something that's full of fiber, they'll be breaking it down many hours later for additional energy. Hey, you know who else has that? Hunter-gatherers. If you go to Africa and look at the microbiome of like the Hudsa tribe, their gut, they have the same gut type bacteria that break down or they did some famous stuff in Burkina Faso showing that the people in the African village have the, the gut bacteria that can break down, quote, complex carbs, indigestible carbs. They break it down. So you could have you were getting energy from Amelia eight eight hours earlier, man. Isn't that amazing? That's I'm why a, they run. I'm all Irish, Perfect. and I had my gut microbiome tested, and it can only break down potatoes and Jameson whiskey. So that's I'm limited to that diet. Hey, what do you think happened to the Neanderthals? That that's a big debate going around, and the Denosovans. Do you think they just they genetically we just married them, absorbed them, or do you think it was a yes, violent and encounter were- and um, it was war? No, the the most recent research shows that their genes were weeded out. And what happened was there was a lot of intermarrying. In fact, they found even from like 45,000 years ago, they found an individual that still had up to 9% uh, DNA from Neanderthals. My, I have about a little bit over 4% of my DNA is Neanderthal. Same here. I have, 200, I have about 277 variants that are Neanderthal-based. Uh, thank God I, I got a couple of good things from my Neanderthal uh, origins. Good white jaws. Never need any orthodontics. I have a great <laughs> airway. The Neanderthal airway was over double as efficient as Homo sapiens. And the Neanderthal airway was set up to be very good for cold, cold climates. And as the climate kept warming going north, um, Homo sapiens could move up. And that's how we got our start because don't forget, um, Caucasians, when you're talking about being Irish, we're only about 8,000, 8,500 to 8,800 years old. And that's when they first started to see those mutations, the SLC45A2 gene pop up. And then about 8,000 years ago, you had the the HERC2 gene, the OCA2 gene, which are the genes for blue eyes and blonde hair. Those popped up, and they were sexually preferred by northerners. Now, the reason these mutations occurred were because when you moved north and there wasn't enough sunlight and you had to start wearing a lot more furs to keep warm, vitamin D deficiency. And to this day, everyone who lives in Chicago is vitamin D deficient. We all have to take our vitamin D every day. It's just absolutely crazy. And that gave another mutation, which is the mutation for the uh, keeping the LCT gene alive, the lactose gene, to, which will produce lactase rather, and break down lactose. That was about 4,300 years ago. So the reason we had to do that was to have vitamin D. And vitamin D is directly related to uh, periodontal disease and also to decay too, which is really fascinating, you know, because how well your teeth are built to begin with makes a big difference. So we've always been at a little bit of a disadvantage uh, being the pioneers. And we just did that following herds. There were hunter gatherers that kept following herds going up and they kept following the grass going up. They kept going up into further, further north and we mutated. So, hey, that brings us to airway. Because that's the biggest thing, too. I know you're going to go that way, is airways getting progressively worse. And our airways are demonstrably, it was a great publication, American Journal of uh, Orthodontics, uh, done at the dental school in Vienna, the medical school in Vienna, where they looked at 94 skulls from the 19th century and compared them to 100 some odd from the 20th century, did a cephalometric analysis and did some a little bit of a PARS analysis, and they found that the jaws were getting more and more narrow. Even the stuff from the plague pits, even the stuff from the great Oslo Norway studies where they looked at children and looked at developing children, the intercanine width significantly gets decreased from the 1500s to 2000s. So our jaws are getting much more narrow. And at the same time, our pharynx is getting longer and our nose has to get longer. And the reason the nose has to get longer, everyone's getting a little bit longer, pointier noses, is because the nose is essential for warming the air so you can humidify it. Otherwise, we're having brain freeze because we're all moved up to these northern climates, which we can live in because we have heating. I want to digress for a minute because this is an issue where I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, 
all my patients who are dermatologists tell everyone to stay out of the sun. Then all my patients that are nutritionists and physical trainers and anything, everything else is saying, no, you need to go get it 10 minutes a day. And it's not enough. Even if you eat outside for lunch and I got a bald head and my forearms are showing, they say that's not enough raw skin. You need 10 minutes, you know, five minutes on each side of you just laying there at noon um, and flip over. And I tell that to my mm-hmm. dermatologist and they go insane. But so, so the public is hearing two exactly opposite pieces of advice. So is it sun or sunscreen for vitamin D? Well, well, here's the problem. You have a dermatologist that thinks that your skin's not part of the body. They're only looking at the skin itself. And of course, you're out in the sun, you're going to increase your chance of having things. Well, even just a couple sunburns can increase your chance of no skin cancer. Um, And of course, you're going to age your skin because of all those extra, you know, um, reactive oxidative species you have going on. So here's the answer. You take some NAC, N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is a precursor to glutathione. So you take, that's what I do. I, if I have to be out in the sun, I still want to get my vitamin D. I don't want to burn. So I take some N-acetylcysteine and it reduces the chance of burning. Now, You'll have people argue that if you overdo your glutathione, you'll increase your chance of cancer because you need to have those reactive oxidative species that kill those rapidly producing uh, cancer cells. I think that's extremely um, unlikely. Um, I uh, Personally, I think if you are an inflammatory type individual, like being Irish, we're prone to inflammation that uh, we're prone to inflammation because we're not on a, the good Irish diet we should have, which is Guinness, soda bread, and uh, corned beef and cabbage every day. <laughs> so let's bring it back home to dentistry. So um, on on Dentaltown, one of the most popular threads under health is the oral systemic health connection. So how do you uh, start changing the gut microbiome? I mean um, – I, I, I just, I, I, it's too much information, but um, uh, Sunday I was at a party and this guy was uh, talking about a study where all the oral probiotics you buy at Walgreens would be better mixed with water and used as an enema um, to get right to the gut microbiome site better. How, how, do you, how do you change the gut microbiome? Oh boy, that is such a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that. I really love that because you see, everything affects it. If you exercise, your gut microbiome changes. Just by that, diet changes your gut microbiome quite a bit. Probiotics can change your gut microbiome. The problem with the probiotics, and I lecture on those extensively, is the majority on the market are worthless. The strain is wrong. You don't need that strain. You already have that strain. You're missing something else vastly more important. You're missing Bacillus subtilis. You're missing Clostridia sporogenes. You're missing something you're just not getting because, you know, you're talking about tens of thousands of strains of bacteria. Most of them are not the right strain. They might be the right species, but they're not the right strain. You know, you have the species, let's say, uh, Lactobacilli ruderi. And there are several known good strains, but there's some that probably do nothing. Uh, the gut microbiome can be a little bit resistant to change, too. So you may have to do all three to get to where you want to be. Now, have you done the American Gut Project yourself, Howard? The American Gut the, Project? I did the 23 yeah. and me. And by That's the way, by DNA. the way, yeah, by the way, I was like 4.5% Neanderthal. Does Neanderthal... Is Caucasian, is that term kind of lost now because it makes more sense to go to DNA and say that that you and I are um, part Neanderthal? We're just hybrids. Yeah, no, you know, it doesn't really matter because there's they, they found the, a lot of Neanderthal genes in Asiatics too, so uh, in Asia. So um, the they basically, they've done some computer modeling on this, the the Neanderthal genes, uh, where they were strong, they made the, hum- the Homo sapien hybrid weaker, like slower, um, because Homo sapiens could run much faster than Neanderthal, and running is very important in escaping 
being a prey or being a predator is very important. Uh, Neanderthals could not throw a spear as well as Homo sapiens. So basically, there was also this. Homo sapien men were felt to prefer Neanderthal women. But Homo sapien women did not in, did not prefer Neanderthal men. And that's a very, very important gateway for an extinction of a, species, uh, of a species right there. So, you know, the Homo sapien men were often chasing Neanderthal women at the same time, Homo sapien women, whereas Homo sapien women just did not like the Neanderthal men. And so that was a gateway stopper right there. That's another postulation. I don't think they'll ever be able to prove that. But that's just one of the things they think. So the airway thing was interesting, too, because, like, thank God, you know, you and I, we probably got a little bit better airway from that Neanderthal. I hope so, the Neanderthal. It made me short. That's one of the things that 23 made me short. But American Gut Project, that's when you send your uh, fecal sample in. They tell you what bacteria you have. And I'm very, very proud to tell you I don't have an American gut. My aim was not looking American at all. And that's because when I travel, I eat local. I always try to eat fresh, local. You know, everything is not processed. And you really want to change your gut microbiome. Stay away from the processed food. Stay away from the GMOs and so on. And now we have even better technology. We're doing something called Viome. And that's not looking at the DNA, Howard. That's looking at the RNA. So you're actually looking at what genes are, have been expressed making proteins. Because like for humans, only 8 to 12% of our DNA is actually expressing for a protein. So that kind of means that a lot of it is just sitting there. That's why we share so many genes with yeast and mold and fruit flies. And you name, we share these genes. It doesn't mean that you're part fruit fly either, you know. So, so you're part so, of the are, are you the Human Microbiome Project? Is that through the NIH? No, the uh, 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 that's different from the American Gut Project. I think that American Gut Project is through the uh, uh, University of San Diego. Uh, the NIH I probably did run the Human Microbiome Project. That was to determine what the human microbiome looks like. Um, but the human microbiome will look different in, let's say, Cambodia than it does in San Diego, than it does in New Jersey. It's going to be a little bit different for it because it differs when you move. If you move to another country, it's going to change a little bit. If I went and lived in uh, Central Africa for three or four years and ate tubers and ate fresh kill off the, off the steps, my gut microbiome would change. And that's what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to. That's why there's gateway microbiomes. They're supposed to uh, respond to the environment and protect you. When we go in and we do these crazy things, like say to our patients, you know, use this antimicrobial mouth rinse three times a day, and you're saying to yourself, "I'm killing three percent pathogens. The other ninety-seven percent I'm killing are the gluten metabolizers to break down the gluten. I'm raising the blood pressure. I'm increasing the chance of erectile dysfunction, periodontal disease." You have to kind of, in the long term, and root caries, uh, you have to kind of want to step back and say, hey, I got to be more specific. And that's one of the big clarion calls coming from the oral systemic health people, like the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. Uh, we had a board meeting yesterday. It was Saturday, like 1 to 10, and we ate dinner and went over stuff, and then uh, also from 7 to 4. And, and the big mission is to get out there and tell people that the mouth is part of the body. And we're finding all these cardiologists who are agreeing, saying like Dr. Lloyd Rudy, saying every time his uh, heart team removed an infected heart valve, Every time it was infected by oral bacteria, the stroke stuff that came out like two weeks ago, right? That when they looked at uh, the clots from strokes, 70, what was it, 79% of them had strep viridans as being the initiator. So you see that the oral bacteria can cause a ton of disease. And that's why they knew about oral systemic health going back all the way to Ramses II. And after the Battle of Kadesh, there was a wall mural you can see in, in Egypt where all these Hittite prisoners are on their knees and their hands up and their mouth was wide open. And the Egyptian soldiers are behind them with their spears forcing them to open their mouth and they're being inspected to see how their teeth are. And you can look at Tacitus, the his, Roman historian, the Roman form, slave market. They, the second thing they looked at 
was the oral cavity. There's famous Renaissance paintings of the Middle Eastern slave markets showing everyone opening their mouth and having their teeth inspected. There's lithographs from the American South. They would look at the mouth as an indication of health. And it, even at Ellis Island, they did the same thing. There's some great stuff of G.V. Black about that. So um, let's get back to the wisdom that our forefathers had to know the mouth is part of the body, just like the skin's part of the body. You need to have these nutrients. You need to have good probiotics. But to know which probiotic to use, you have to know which one you're missing. You have to know which bacteria you're missing. It could be Oxalobacter formigenes. It could be the bacillus. Now, how do you get bacillus? Bacillus pumilus, bacillus subtilis. Well, every time you buy uh, chicken now, They've been giving them lots of bacillus subtilis because that's how they're raising them without antibiotics. It makes the chickens healthier. You don't, they don't need to have antibiotics. And when you eat that chicken, you're getting some bacillus subtilis because that is a ground organism that the chickens used to get from pecking at the ground to get the bacillus subtilis. And that is the famous probiotic that the Germans used in World War II in North Africa to save their men. This is 1941. Germany, Nazi Germany, gave the Africa Corps Bacillus subtilis. It's a famous Bacillus subtilis story to save their men's life from dysentery in World War II. And I keep saying, if we've known this, like Meshnikov in 1907 saying there's many positive bacteria. Then 1908, who wins the Nobel Prize for phagocytosis research. If we have known this for well over a century, Howard, why aren't we adopting this? Why aren't we realizing that there's a strong oral systemic health? Why aren't we utilizing the probiotics and the polyols to maintain the health of our patients? You know, I, I mentioned that study we did with probiotics. That was the most effective way. We had 60 kids that we started off with that were extremely caries prone. Three years later, we got like 53 of them back. And only four remained caries prone. The rest of them have been turned around with probiotics. And we published that. And, you know, people are still going like, well, probiotics. It has to be a good probiotic. Now, those are two very good probiotics, by the way. They weren't the junk stuff you see. Uh, yeah, this stuff is unregulated. There's a lot of stuff that's not real probiotics at all and that's what's giving everything a bad name uh so it's 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 like this one study on, on probiotics and yogurt howard it's it's funny people quote that all the time saying look these people who use this yogurt they actually gain weight and they had other issues and then you look at the the yogurt they use it wasn't a real yogurt at all it was one of these artificial things and it was full of high fructose corn syrup and <laughs> everything you go like i wonder why they gain weight they're adding all these extra calories per day <laughs> well i was i was very surprised just recently right here in my backyard in phoenix in scottsdale's mayo clinic and they started doing fecal matter transplants so this oh, yeah. is this is really a thing where people are so serious about you know you say change it with uh, diet, exercise, and probiotics, yeah, yeah. and a big probiotic now is fecal matter transplants. Do you call it? Do you oh con- yeah. Do you consider that a probiotic, or is that? Wh- oh yeah, because you're actually you're giving them probiotics from someone else. Now, the, the, there's two great studies we can talk about on that. One, it was done at the Academic Medical Center in uh, Amsterdam, and what they did is they called out for volunteers. They had people come in. They classified them as to being diabetic, pre-diabetic, metabolic syndrome, overweight, underweight normal weight and they collected their fecal matter and then you came back and you received someone else's it was random everything was randomized so you came back as a volunteer they're amazed how many volunteers came and if you were a metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetic and you got a fecal transplant from someone who was normal you know normal blood sugar and everything uh, normal insulin sensitivity you know what it you got cured it's a great study. You got cured. In fact, you lost weight, which is one of the other things they've shown in many, many probiotic studies. Um, that's a fascinating one to read up on, and everyone who reads that goes like, holy cow. Now, if you were overweight, had diabetes, you received a fecal transplant from someone else who was overweight and had diabetes, guess what? Nothing happened. 
you know. So that's really how – and they've done this many, many times with mice, by the way, and, and rats. I mean, it's been done so many times. Where you could find dozens of published studies on that with animals. The other big one is at the Karolinska Institute under Tori Medved. They've done all these great studies, human studies, and they have this capsule that has 200 uh, strain of positive bacteria – that they've been giving to people who have all sorts of issues from uh, depression, anxiety, everything, everything gets better. Everything gets better. Um, neurological symptoms go down. It, it helps everything because it boosts your entire immune system. And again, it's they've done all these clinical trials. You cannot get their capsule in the United States. They cannot produce enough of it for all the clinical trials going on. And I have to tell you that that came from the EVE Project, Howard, where they went in, and this is what they've been doing in these other countries because they can. They have National Health Service. They have these huge data banks. So they data mined everyone in Sweden who had never been sick. Then they contacted them, and they checked to make sure all their visits were well visits only. Never came in sick. They found a whole group of people who'd never been sick, no cancer, nothing, not even a cold. And they found these people always lived in a rural area or on the sea or up toward a mountain someplace. And they always ate fresh food. And they always they, – I mean, they could eat a ton of butter, but it was fresh butter everything. And they took their fecal samples and they kept, kept them alive. And then they kept checking it for any changes. And they kept checking the patients to see if they ever got cancer or anything and how their health would be maintained. And from that great project – Brilliant research, a tremendous amount of work. They have their fecal sample, which is just awesome. So that's so, the route we're going. So, so you were saying, though, that in order to change your uh, – in order to talk about probiotics, you first need to know what's in your gut microbiome. So are you recommending to dentists listening to this that they should send their poop into the uh, the um, American Gut Project to find out what it looks like? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, they can do that, or even better, do Viome. Uh, Viome, B-I-O-M-E, is the one that uses the RNA technology. And that RNA technology tells you everything that's being expressed. Now, we've done that for myself. I have for my poop. You get back tons of information. Just amazing what you get back. Uh, because it includes the viruses and everything, the yeast, the mold, the viruses. You get all the information what virus you have in your gut. Uh, but we're doing oral virum, biome, and mitochondrial swabs on my patients with autism. We have an IRB-approved study uh, where we're testing the patients we have with autistic spectrum disorder because they have a completely unique microbiome, oral and gut, of course. The oral determines the gut. And uh, so much so, you can diagnose autism with an accuracy of over 96% by just taking a sample of their saliva and checking the microbiome in the mouth. So you said use biome. Is that biome makers biome. in, uh, in uh, Sacramento, California? Is that biome? No, it's by V. V as in oh, victory. Oh, biome. I, I, oh, yeah, the V as in victory, I in Irene, O as in Omar, M as in Mary, E as in English. Oh, okay. And, and um, so you can um, contact them at Viome. They have some specials where you can get it. Uh, yeah, like over Father's Day, it was like $149 for having a complete gut thing. And in the future for dentists, every patient will be doing oral one. In the future, very, very soon, and we'll be doing the cheek swabs and looking at mitochondrial health because you can look at that mitochondrial DNA and see if they have the novel biomarkers for periodontal disease and for atherosclerosis, which, by the way, Howard, they're the same 12 novel biomarkers. Atherosclerosis and periodontal disease has the exact same 12 novel biomarkers. Now, now how, much of the, how much do you think of this is um – are my, are, is dentistry. I mean, there's 2 million dentists around the world. There's 200,000 in the United States. What percent of the dentists are buying into this? And what percent of the dentists do you think uh, think this is bleeding edge, not leading edge? This is a uh, hokey pokey. Um, it's going to need well, another uh, decade or so to, to, to the jury's still out. Where, where, where do dentists well, sit with this? Well, there's like over 26,000 published articles on probiotics right now. If you go look at PubMed, there's over 2,500 clinical trials, and the vast, vast, vast majority and the high 90 percentiles are positive. 
you have to look hard to find a negative one. Uh, and when you do, you can find all sorts of errors in their methodology, which is really fascinating. Um, and how can you not, when they have known for thousands of years the connection between oral health and systemic health, how it's just like denying that the world is round. It's, it's like a that has to be based on some type of strange belief. Or it's driven by economics because they think, well, I don't get paid for this stuff. But the reality is if you have a practice and you believe in total health care for your patients, the patients know it and they are loyal to you because you don't try to sell them anything. You just tell them, this is what you should do. I tell these kids all the time that, that come in with their little ones. I said, what are you doing for your own health? Are you drinking kefir? Because here's a classic study that came out of Finland. The mom's microbiome determines what type of breast milk she produces for the baby. And if the breast milk, the mom's microbiome is wrong, the breast milk is wrong, the baby has a hard time feeding and they get colicky. So, hey, you want your baby asleep? You have a good probiotic. I recommend for a lot of people they use like Lifeway kefir. I, you have that down, right? Right. Well, why? Yeah, why is that's... why is that kefir taking off so much? Everybody down here is talking about it. Well, because it has twelve very positive strains of bacteria. There are very high amounts. You get about twenty billion CFUs with about a cup of it every morning, and it's it's their live bacteria. And you want to make sure that you keep the kefir for a while, so it has the bacteria have the chance to digest all the sugars that are in there. And by the time you drink it, everything's broken down. I mean, it's basically lactose free and everything. And it's just a healthy way of doing what they've been doing in in uh, Bulgaria and other parts of the world, Greece, for like two, 3,000 years. And uh, it's uh, always positive to have good bacteria that are there, the lactobacilli, that many of them, like lactobacilli ruteri, have been dis- – there's like hundreds of studies on lactobacilli ruteri, literally hundreds. And uh, – that's why it's taking off. That's an easy one. And you know what you got. I mean, uh, Lifeway is out of Skokie of Illinois, and they have done a really great job of making sure they're giving you the right strains. So that's why it's taken off, Howard. So so, they, so the dentist should, um, let's say this, should stop eating processed food and eat whole, you know, biological, diverse bacteria food. Yep. They should exercise mm-hmm. more. But back Absolutely. to, but back to, you know, let's uh, um, talk about some dentist and he's older. He's um, wants to aggressively change his gut microbiome. You uh, probiotics, you said was a great question. Um, the diet's obvious, the exercise is obvious, but back to the gut microbiome, would you go to Mayo Clinic and do fecal transplants? Would you recommend that they first do this Viome where they send a poop sample to Viome? Yes. That, that'd be Viome your first. Ashley. That, that'd yeah, be your first move? Would, yeah, yeah, Viome will actually give you the recommendations and diet and everything. And, you know, from your 23 Me, did you do the uh, Found My Fitness, Howard? Um, 23 and Me, you did that. So there's something called Found My Fitness with Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and they make recommendations off of your 23 and Me as to what you should do for health. Huh, I did not, I did not see that. So is that your um, – is that the – Bio uh, DNA sampling place you like the most, 23andMe? Is that, uh, well, I think that's Google's I, I, founder's I, I, wife. I like it so much I gave it as gifts to people. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too. I did I did too. Yeah, yeah, I think it was one of the number one gifted things because uh, to me, uh, it's got to be somewhat accurate because I have a family history that my family has kept going back unbelievably far. You wouldn't believe if I told you how far back that was handwritten and passed down from great, great, great grandparents and so on. And, uh, and photos too, photos that go way back to the civil war. Um, the, the early photos like Matthew Brady type photos. Um, so the, um, the funny thing is what 23 and me said match a hundred percent, the family history, hundred percent right down to every date was exactly correct. Now I thought that was fascinating. Huh. That, that, that is right. And, and then you also talked about uh, dental decay and some of these um, um, sugar-free um, substitutes trying to reduce decay. But are, are you a fan of that or not? 
Oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of, of xylitol and erythritol. You can, uh, it has many anti inflammatory things, and erythritol and xylitol both are very strong uh, inhibitors of not just strep mutans, but more importantly, of the biofilm formation. It breaks up how much the plaque changes the type of plaque, too. It changes the type of byproducts in the plaque. Well proven, many articles on that. And then inhibits the periodontal pathogens, too. Uh, Porphyrmones, gingivalis, fusobacterium, nucleatum. So it goes right down the line, and it barely inhibits the lactobacilli. And most of the lactobacilli, it pretty much leaves alone. And those guys, uh, what leaves alone are the who's who's of probiotics. So you, we finally have something that's a smart kill on what we want to get rid of, and it leaves alone the lactobacilli paracasei to prevent cavities because you want to make sure you leave those guys alone. You want to leave alone the ruderi and the ramosus and all the other good ones. Well, I think a lot of dentists are listening to this podcast that are pediatric dentists because – I mean, you're uh, gloriously recognized uh, pediatric dentist for 40 years. Um, what, what do you What do you think about your profession in pediatric dentistry four decades after you walked out of uh, Northwestern? Well, I got recruited by one of the founders of pediatric dentistry, Dr. Ralph Ireland, who told me. Uh, he took me to his office and said, "I want you to be a pediatric dentist because we have three obligations to practice, so we know." what we're doing so we can number two teach because everyone had an obligation to teach at the time we were told we had to teach and practice and three do research he called the three horsemen of pediatric dentistry you have to do all three i took it to heart back in what was it 74 75 1974 1975 and i've been doing that ever since and uh that was before we had all this economic pressure from um, uh, insurance companies and PPOs and DMOs and DSOs and you name all the alphabet out there. And, of course, uh, I've seen the uh, government assistance programs going from actually paying for procedures to paying for absolutely nothing. And then uh, we, we're in Illinois, so we're the, we're the state where last year – for a patient, we might receive a check for twelve cents. So you're we, you're, we you're in Chicago. <laughs> there, there was another pediatric uh, dentist legendary, Fred Margolis. Um, we had him on the show uh, one oh seven, and then he passed away. He was kind of really introducing lasers to pediatric dentistry in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Did you know Fred, and what did you think of that? Oh, I knew very, Fred very very well. I knew Fred very very well. And and do you and agree? we use lasers. Go ahead. We use lasers a lot for soft tissue. Um, I actually did the research on that um, and uh, in biomaterials, and I actually prefer using ultrasonic dentistry for that. Um, it gives a better bond. It's uh, more precise using ultrasonic dentistry for the exact same thing he was using the laser for. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's where I stand on it. And I know Fred did sadly pass away, and... Um, uh, he is someone I would see all the time at meetings. And you're also in the same city as Lynn Margulis, who uh, was a, an American evolutionary theorist and biologist. I mean, she was a legendary in everything you're talking about. Um, were you familiar with Lynn Margulis and her work in Chicago? No, I really did not ever meet her. No, I did not ever meet her. And uh, my stuff all got started being driven by the microbiome because – as you know, in some very, very top journals, and including the Journal of Microbiology, they've had these great articles about the holobiome, that the host, the human in our case, and our bacteria, our symbiotic bacteria, form one giant genome, which they call the hologenome. And the bacteria genetics drives our evolution. And it does so first by having an epigenetic effect. So my way went the other way. I went from microbiome into more genetics because the epigenetic effect. And then that influences us genetically by the constant turning off and on of genes changes our evolution. I, I want to go to the, the oral uh, biome. Um, in your profession, the most controversial thing that came, came to it is the silver diamine fluoride. And some people say you're you're tipping the the um, the oral microbiome to where 
It's slowing down the rate of infection so slow that the pulp is laying secondary dentin in the baby teeth and it's not causing an abscess. And other people uh, say, no, you need to do a pulp on immunochrome still crown. Then the pediatric dentists who love it are saying, yeah, but this two-year-old would require to be go to an OR with an anesthesiologist, and that's a high-risk, dangerous procedure. And then and then when they start fighting bloody on Dental Town, then it comes down to, uh, well, Mark, you're just saying that because Delta will pay you so much money more for a pulpotomy and a chrome still crown or Medicaid or whatever, and they're not paying me anything hardly to paint on this silver diamine fluoride. It's so complex, but it's so emotional. It's the only thing I've seen at a dinner party at a bar where you can lead to profanity. And I've seen that a few times between pediatric dentists. Where do you sit on this whole, that rant? Where, 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 if you had a couple of beers, how would you chime in? I tell them the research that we've done. And we've done actually a good amount. In fact, we developed a new cytotoxicity testing method just to look at the cytotoxicity of silver diamine fluoride. So here's the important thing. Silver diamine fluoride is very valuable, but it must be used by someone who knows how to use it. So a pediatric dentist who's looking at this kid and they have these lesions and they can't get them into the OR for any reason. I mean, it might be a reason where it's not just the cost. It might be your operating rooms are backed up for six months. Or your, if you use mobile anesthesia, maybe they can't come to your office for three or four months. The silver diamine fluoride will buy you time. But we've seen it used where people have placed it on necrotic teeth. Teeth are already necrotic, and then the kid gets a big abscess because it, it was already irreversible pulpitis. They needed to have a pulpotomy and a stainless steel crown. The worst issue we have with it is it is safe as directed. And we see pediatricians placing silver diamine fluoride. We hear about school nurses placing silver diamine fluoride. They don't have the lights. They don't have the suction. They don't have the isolation. If you put silver diamine fluoride on soft tissue, that is a big, big no-no. We showed significant damage to fresh dermal fibroblasts. And we have actually presented this at meetings saying, okay, it's like anything else. You wouldn't let a pediatrician do a pulpotomy. You wouldn't let a pediatrician place a zirconium crown, pediatricians should not be using silver diamine fluoride. They don't have the training. They don't have the expertise. And if you can't handle a two- or three-year-old child, you shouldn't be using it. But having said that, if, like in my practice, if we have someone that we need to delay decay, and that's what you're doing is you're delaying decay. That's what fluoride basically does, right? It delays decay. There's all these great studies showing that fluoride takes decay that would have happened from 0 to 10 years of age and pushes it 10 to 20 years of age. Decay that would have happened from 0 to 20 pushes it 20 to 40. That's why by age 65, 98% of Americans have fillings is it pushes it back, which is fine if you all died at 65. But I'm be- I know you're under 65, Howard, but I'm over 65. So... See, I, I break the mold there. So the thing with silver diamine fluoride is you do have to re- reapply every six months. So it should be done by qualified dentists. And um, yeah, I can see everyone's point of view because yes, I've had kids come in with abscess teeth and the teeth have silver diamine fluoride on it. That was poor choice. That was poor case selection, poor use of the material. It'd be just like if I had tried to place a gold foil in the front tooth of a two-year-old. That's just not what you're supposed to do. So what advice would you give to the young, uh, uh, you did pediatric dentistry for four decades and we just had a whole graduating class walk out last month, a pediatric dentist. Um, what, what would you tell them? What would you tell the young kids? Um, oh, I what, tell what them advice the same would thing. you give them? I was, I, I, I lectured on this about what, 12, 14 years ago. I gave a presentation at the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry meeting and I called it standing at the crossroads. And you know, there's a picture with a crossroads. I said, we can go one way or the other way. You can either go on like the pediatric dentist of lore, where you do the three horsemen, you try to develop new materials, as you know, I've been involved with a lot of dental material developments too. What are the three horsemen? 
um, research, teaching, and uh, practice. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, it's it's a tough schedule, but, you know, that's what you do, research, teaching, practice. And Or you can become one of those people who shows up at the office and you just do procedures. You're not treating a patient, but you're doing lots of procedures. Uh, let's see, how many stainless steel crowns are we doing this morning? And how many composites are we doing this morning? How many sealants are we doing? Whereas, basically... For a lot of us, I think that's why there's so many people going into oral systemic health. They can't look at themselves as being a healer, you know, not just a provider of services. We're a healer. We're here to teach. We're here to educate. Remember, the doctor means educator, means teacher. <laughs> so by being a doctor, we're a teacher, and we're supposed to teach health. And that means they come in, they're on bad diet, you talk to them about diet. They come in, they're using the wrong toothpaste, you talk to them about toothpaste. You make sure that they're using something that is going to be very valuable for them for the rest of their lives. What do you see in pediatric dentistry right now that bothers you the most? When you're looking at pediatric oh, dentistry at 30,000 feet, what, what, what bothers you the most? Uh, I want the young people to be as enthused as I have been in my profession. And I want the young people to spend the time to look at new ways and better ways of serving their patients and to not just accept the status quo. You know, Howard, you probably have heard that a lot of times I will come out with something, not as a contrarian, but because I feel strongly that just because everyone thinks a certain way is not correct, right? And I've always been pushing the envelope and trying to say, hey, you know, we need to change what we're doing so we can provide the best care. I want every young person. I, here, here, I can do this. I, 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 I was I, lecturing. I, I, I just, I just want to uh, go. Go ahead. You, you want to finish that, or do you want me to ask another? The, the, well, here's one last thing. On okay, that. okay. I was lecturing in Wisconsin, and one of my former students came up and said, "You know, I graduated from Northwestern in 1982. I want to introduce Dr. Cannon." He says, "There are several things I'll never forget. I learned from him." First, um, he said, uh, what I teach you today will be wrong tomorrow. <laughs> I always told that because it's true. Well, yeah, teach you today will be wrong tomorrow. And second thing he said is, don't believe everything you read, especially not in a textbook, because those people write books and don't do dentistry. And it also takes them five years to write a textbook, and then it takes them yep. a year or two to get it published. Then they sell yep. it for 10 years. So you're yeah. this kid walking into a private dental school at hundred thousand dollars a year, reading a yeah. history book, ten years old. But I want to go back to specifics because when I'm talking to pediatric dentists online at Dental Town, what's the the worst nightmare in the world is you take a kid to the OR and he doesn't wake up, and you're in Chicago, and right in your backyard, Doctor Charles J. Code, M.D. Professor of oh, Anesthesiology yeah. and Pediatrics at Northwestern University um, just yeah. just published a guideline that he recommends at least two individuals with specific training and credentials should be present with a pediatric patient undergoing deep general uh, anesthesia for dental treatment in a dental facility or a hospital surgery center. That that should have been. I mean, what percent today is going to be one person? What would you guess? Well, um, I hope not very many because there's always supposed to be two. Um, and we do office-based anesthesia, but there's always two experienced people. And you might call me the third because I did do my anesthesia training at Northwestern at, you know, it's just my rotation, of course, at Children's Hospital. But I've intubated a large number of people myself, and um, I can maintain the airway. I can do all that stuff. My fear is that there are people who take it lightly, and you should never take it lightly. As I used to do at, at Northwestern at Children's, I was in the OR all day Monday and Wednesday. So I don't know how many hundreds of cases I've done. I mean, it could but, be a but thousand. You, but I'm, I'm talking about what percent of pediatric dentists are doing the anesthesiology and doing the oh, dentistry I on general know. sedation? I, I hope they're not doing it. They, you cannot do that. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I so know you, they say you don't they, think that's going on in the United States right now today. It, it probably is. Um, I'd rather it not. I'm but sure you know, but you know it is. 
Yeah, I just don't know what the percentage. I, right, I, right, I don't right. Know who does that. It's the same I, thing I, with antibiotics. The old guys. I mean, I have so many adorable dental friends that are grandpas, and you, you they still every single root canal. 10 VK, 500 milligram, 28 tabs, 28 tabs, uh, 16 tabs of Vicodin, and okay. they're not going to change. So these younger kids are coming out of school, and the most stressful is when you come out of school and you're going in to work with your beloved mom who's a dentist or dad who's a dentist, and they're doing yep. these things like the general sedation while they're pulling the wisdom teeth on a teenager yep. or a, ch- a two-year-old, uh, you know, and they're giving uh, a round of antibiotics and Vicodin after every root canal or extraction. Yeah. And it's just yep. – um, so so looking at that data, I'd want to see are we talking about a young millennial or are we talking about old grandpa who needs to be retired off to the golf course as soon as possible? Uh, but, you know, Charles, well, would, think- you, you agree with all of his work. Well, I, I have to tell you two things on that. Number one, I'm a grandpa. Okay, I got two grandchildren, and um, there are elderly people, and, and we're young yet. Howard, you and I were both very young. Um, we can't. We we keep it up to date. I mean, I keep up very, very up to date. And I, I, I'm sometimes I'm shocked when I'm talking to uh, a young graduate who doesn't know anything and it's new or modern, like you said, they're, they're, sometimes they're being taught by faculty who are, should have been retired years ago, too. Um, the, the second thing on that is um, uh, oral surgeons are probably the biggest number of people doing deep sedation without someone experienced with them besides them. And they have been doing that for decades. So I don't think that's going to change. I want, I want, to, ask, I want to ask you another dentistry uncensored uh, controversial deal. I just... I'm, I know there's a lot of pediatric dentists listening to this deal because I'm going to call you out as a pediatric dentist. Um, first two words of the, the podcast. So I, I know they're going to listen to it. And the other big stress they're having is this vaccination deal. Some pediatric dentists want to have a sign that says, we do not accept your unvaccinated child in my office because they don't want any um, thing going on. What would you think if a young pediatric dentist in Chicago said, I'm going to put a sign on my door and we do not want unvaxxed kids in our office. How does that sit well, with you? The, here's the problem I have with this is that the, that decision was not made by the child. That decision was made by the parent, not the child. And you can never punish ethically a child for bad decisions of the parent. So, And every parent does have a right to determine what their child has. So if like, I raise five kids and I would feel extremely put upon because I'm naturally a libertarian. If someone told me I had to, for instance, take my child to do a certain procedure and I felt that was not an American way of life. We've got to be Americans first. We have to really respect and honor the freedom and the sacrifices people have made to give us the freedom to have freedom of choice and not live in the gulag atmosphere. So what I do is I do advise and that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to teach and educate, allow them to make their decision, the best educated decision they can make. But if that meant turning away a child in pain, turning away a child with an infection, I would not do it because now you're punishing the child for a decision made by the parent. It's so, the sins of But it's the, the same thing. In it. But they, they always say it's the same thing where you see all these school districts now from New Zealand to Australia to all, all around the world saying your kid can't come to school if it's not vaccinated. So that's kind of a backdoor approach of government forced vaccination right. against your libertarian views. Where, where do you stand on that? Do you think that do you think well, school systems here, can, can do that? Here, schools that say that, for instance, and there are states that have different laws. Every state in the United States has different laws in dealing with it, freedom of choice and so on. But the school is optional. You can opt out of the school. You can say, I, I, I'm not taking my kids to that school. I'm going to do homeschool or I'm going to put them in a parochial school. And that is your right. And I defend people's right to do that because there's many, many a parent who's been in a bad school district where the kids just don't get a decent education, and they've said, hey, I'm going to pay out of pocket to take my child to a parochial school. That is their right. So okay, um, one, one I also have the right to say, no, we won't take you, but that's fine. You have the right to say, that's fine. I'm not going there. 
Oh my God. My, my redneck dentist friends from Texas, Oklahoma and Kansas and Arizona, when you start talking about government forced vaccination, they're, they're just ready to line up and start shooting at you. Hey, and then they're dentists. I want to ask another very specific question. The, the questions get very important as they get more expensive. And a lot of these young pediatric dentists, uh, I'm going to go back to lasers with Fred Margolis. Um, they're saying like, like St. Solea. Um, if some young kid was opening up his pediatric dentist office in Chicago today, would you recommend the use of any of these lasers? Because they're usually a hundred thousand dollars. So you're no, talking I to a not. twenty-five no. year old scared kid. So your answer to no. lasers is no. No, I would I would get a soft tissue laser. Definitely, you absolutely, absolutely, positively have to have a good diode laser, like for phrenectomies and and uh, phrenectomies. I do a lot of laser procedures. Give a name uh, brand. They, they want they always want name brands. Oh, I, I use I use the KVO diode laser. You can't buy it now at the nine eighty. Um, of course, AMD has lasers too. Those are like four thousand uh, dollars. The AMD ones. Um, but for soft, for hard tissue, when you're starting off, you can get a good hand piece, as you know, on eBay <laughs> for 20 bucks. So uh, when you're starting off on that debt, you, you can, I'm being very practical. Yeah, very, I, I, very practical. I, want, I want you to. I, I'm being, and the other thing is, you know, buy a good ultrasonic unit, use ultrasonic dentistry. I mean, that just cuts preps very, very nicely for the small pits, the small buckle pits and all the preventive restorations. And what, what ultrasonic, ultrasonic would you recommend? Oh my God. You get a Chinese one called Sea Sky for like what? 90 bucks, hundred bucks. You know, the funny thing about this is, um, we're in an age where dental equipment, if you shop can be extremely reasonable contrary to education what was education. the name what was the name of that laser the um the the it's ultrasonic cable? no no the the oh, ultrasonic scale the one c sky c sky and just just c um hyphen sky or just uh c yeah, just uh, s e a s k y is a chinese s e say it small again s e a s k why? Hey, it's just an ultrasonic that you use for scaling. You can also use it for cutting small preps. Extremely comfortable. They sell all these little diamond points for it, so you can cut little preventive restorations, buckle pits, and small occlusals. So last don't need any last uh, dentistry uncensored question. Uh, another debate. I'm going from you know death and destruction to spending a hundred grand. Um, there's a lot of dentists who, a lot of pediatric dentists who tell me they do not believe in sealants anymore. You're taking technology to acid etch and bond to detonate and enamel, but you're acid etching pits and fissures filled with Oreo cookies. And they see that so much research shows that half the sealants fail the first year. They all fail the second year. And they would rather just do a preventative resin restoration and clean out the pit and fissure. And basically, you're doing an occlusal composite which they say in five years, 90% of them are still there. So are, have sealants gone extinct and replaced with preventative resin restorations, a.k.a. an inclusive composite? Well, what they're basically doing is what I do anyway. I, I take that ultrasonic and I use a very fine point to it and I clean out all the pits and fissures. And then when you do the sealant, it'll last much, much longer. And the other thing is, I hate to say it, but I have lectured on sealants, and I've had people come up to me afterwards saying, we have a high sealant failure rate. They're all done by my dental assistants. And one person said, hey, I actually timed how long they were etching. It was seven seconds. You cannot etch enamel in seven seconds. And this is part of the big, the, the average, the edge time, the biggest issue. The other thing is there's many different types of sealants. You know, if you use on patients who are young patients, a hydrophobic sealant material, and this is throw out from Ultradent Ultra Seal, it's very hydrophobic, um, then you would have to use their primer beforehand because there's always moisture left in the pits and grooves. Good research on that. So when I did a sealant study back like 15 years ago, and we used a flowable composite, and we cleaned the pits and grooves, and we etched for the full 30 seconds and rinsed for 20 seconds and cured for 40 seconds, 
we had 96% stay the first year. And wow. after even three years, so it is very technique sensitive. Now, that was not very realistic how we did it. So what we use in the office is we use a hydrophilic sealant material, which is from pulp then called Embrace. It's a hydrophilic resin. If there is moisture, so we get a secondary etch, so it, it, it's not repelled from the moisture deep in the pits and grooves. It actually soaks into it and does a secondary etch in that because it's a self-etching type material because it is a very acidic hydrophilic material. You like cure that. And you make sure you do it for 40 seconds, not 20. There's a reason why. I won't, it takes too long to talk about it. But then you'll find we have a very high sealant retention rate. Ours is much, much higher than what they have. But they're using the wrong materials, and they're not watching the etch time. Uh, we actually had an independent observer come in to watch us do sealants. And one of the things they commented on is you guys etch for the full 30 seconds. You also agitated the etch, so you got a good etch. Whereas if you don't do that, if you don't agitate the etching for the 30 seconds, they're going to pop off, dude. So you where, have where is a year? Where is uh, Sky C? Where, where is that located? Where, where are they making all these? Sea uh, Sky or Sky? Uh, did you uh, say Sky uh, Skiers? Sea Sky. Sea Sky. Oh, okay. It, it's, it's, I hate to tell you this, it's eBay. I'm going to have every dealer call me. Yeah, eBay, me now. eBay's, eBay's selling it, but where are they making uh, Sea Sky? Oh, um, China. China. All that stuff's made in China. Everything you buy is made in China. Huh. So is it the yeah, Sea yeah, Sky Group? No, that's I forgot, it's a Chinese name. That's just their name they call it. They have other things like Woodpecker. They, they make products oh, okay. called Woodpecker and so on. Okay. Yeah, you know. Everything you buy is made in China anyway. I mean, it just depends how many middlemen you want to pay. So is there anything um, – my, my God, we went an hour and a half. We were supposed to do an hour. They're sitting there listening to me right now saying, when is when are they going to stop? Uh, is there anything that I um, should have asked you about pediatric dentistry for these young pediatric dentist graduates? Well, I would say there's about a dozen things, but that would take us the rest of the day. So we should probably, for those poor people who are sitting in their car saying, I want to go park my car right now, I'm still listening to this podcast, uh, why don't we call it quits for today? Hey, you know, I wish you'd make us an online CE course. Um, we, um, they're just an hour long. They're all ADA approved. We put up 400 courses and they're coming up on a million views. The, these millennials, um, you know, it's, it's low cost. It's, it's only an hour. You would raise the, um, the profile of our prestige by having a course on from the legendary you. Uh, do you think you'd ever make an online uh, course for Dentaltown? Sure. On sure, let's do it. All right. Well, hey, it was a. Um, I knew it was going to be fun. When I woke up this morning. I was so excited. Uh, you know, Monday's podcasting day, and you're my first one. I was so excited. I'm a big fan. Uh, I've been following you for so long, and I just want to tell you today, it was just an honor and a privilege to podcast you. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be on your program. It was a lot of fun, and uh, good luck with everybody and everything. And enjoy Arizona because it's chilly up here in Chicago.